This uh, talk today is going to be held by uh, Nikki Gunindar Kaur Singh. Really happy to host her. Uh, my name is Jawala Singh, for those who don't know. Um, I'm the lecturer uh, of Punjabi here at UC Berkeley. And this event is being hosted through the support of the SIC and the Punjabi Studies Initiative here at UC Berkeley. So I'll just give you a quick uh, intro about how this event was going to proceed. Dr. Uh, Singh is going to present for about 30 to 40 minutes. After that, I'm going to have a quick discussion with her for maybe about uh, five to 10 minutes. And then after that, we'll be taking questions. But feel free to use the chat box. Send us questions while uh, the talk's going on, and then we'll uh, discuss them uh, at the end. So Dr. Nikki Gunindarkor is somebody that needs absolutely no introduction in the field of six studies. She's written many books. She's focused on poetics. She's po focused on uh, feminist issues related to Sikh scripture, the Sikh community. She's recently published uh, this book with uh, Harvard Press, uh, The Poems of Guru Nanak. And actually, it's a very auspicious day today, as uh, at least in the Vikri, Vikrami Samat calendar, uh, today is the uh, Gorta Gadi of Guru Granth Sahib, uh, given at uh, Sachkan Siri Hazur Sahib by Guru Gobind Singh to Guru Granth Sahib. So it's uh, an auspicious day to be talking about Sikh scripture and understanding Sikh scripture. I really uh, love uh, Dr. Uh, Singh's approach uh, in looking at poetics and really getting at uh, kind of the essence, uh, ras, the flavor. And she's been writing about this uh, for many, many years. Um, but now I, I really do uh, really want to encourage everybody to take a look at her, her new book, The Poems from Guru Granth Sahib. It really conveys uh, the meanings of Guru Granth Sahib in English in a really uh, beautiful way that people can understand uh, who are, you know, English readers. So uh, with that, I will introduce uh, Dr. Uh, Nikki Gunindar Kaur Singh. We go back many years, so I'm really happy uh, that you're here uh, to present here at Berkeley uh, to the students here and to the uh, worldwide audience as well. So uh, with that, uh, Nikki, you can take it away and share your screen. So, am I... Is this, is this? Yeah, you can just hit, uh, yeah. perfect. Yep. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Joel. It's a real delight to be here and to be connected with the worldwide audience. Um, and bhot bhot mubarak for the beautiful auspicious day. And thank you, Punita, for getting us started. Um, I had known you since you were a tiny tot. Your parents were most gracious hosts to me when I would go to Canada. So I'm very grateful and to see you kind of blossoming and doing Punjabi and teaching, that is absolutely such an honor and profound joy for me. Uh, so today we are, as you asked me to do, discuss Guru Nanak, the poet, literary and visual translations. So um, there are three things I want to do. One kind of look at Guru Nanak as the poet. We know him as the guru. He's the founder of the Sikh tradition, born in 15th century India in a very rich milieu with the Hindu and Muslim presence between them. So culturally, philosophically, uh, ethnically, linguistically, it's a very rich, rich, rich landscape. So that's where he is. And as we all know, he's the founder, but we want to look at his poetry, at his poetic. And I must say, um, I'm going back to my very, very first book, uh, Physics and Metaphysics of the Guru Granth, which was uh, my honors thesis when I was an undergraduate at, Kobe, at Wellesley College. I teach at Kobe, but I was at Wellesley as an undergrad. And for my senior year, I chose that. And to me, that, you know, that insight into how Sikh scripture on the one hand is so metaphysical, so philosophical, the content is all the transcendent one, and yet it is so physical, it's so sensuous and so palpable. And that interlink, that symbiosis, that kind of total linkage, bond, is what I had been for years and years, as Joala said, have been pursuing, very deeply interested in, and that's what I want to share with you. So, and then, so the poet Nanak, and uh, 
the literary translations, what I did, the, my verbal translations. And I also want to share with you a little bit of the visual translations. And that is, you know, some of the early manuscripts uh, uh, on the life and stories of Guru Nanak and how they kind of translate uh, Guru Nanak's verse in their own language of colors. So it's the paintings that, you know, it's beautiful, beautiful paintings. And I'll share with you a few of those. So that's what we are doing. Hope that's okay, Jala. If you want me to change anything, let me know. Um, yeah, okay. Sounds amazing. So yeah. this is kind of the, um, I want to show you the Guru Granth Sahib. This is the Sikh scripture. The blueprint for it is Guru Nanak's verse. So this is a huge text of 1430 portfolio pages. It starts out with Guru Nanak's Japji. So this is Guru Nanak's verse about the one reality, Ik Onkar. And as you can see, it's all in brocades. And then of course, uh, it was Guru Arjun in 1604 who compiled the text going back as a paradigm. Guru Nanak was the paradigm. His verse, his poetry, his openness, his plurality, that became the model. And so as the gurus progress, the fifth guru is the one who compiled the verses and gave it the form of the Guru Granth Sahib. And um, it was enshrined in the Golden Temple. Golden Temple today is very, very ostentatious and so forth. At that time, it was a very simple structure, but very beautiful. And that's where it was installed. And then as Jwala reminded us, it was Guru Gobind Singh who apotheosized the book and made it the guru forever. So this is the guru for the Sikhs, the guru in perpetuity. And so, this is the central, what should I say, the center of Sikh philosophy for ethics, for rituals, ceremonies. Um, so the uh, Kirtaniyas, um, the people, the musicians are singing the verses from the Guru Granth Sahib itself. Everybody comes, people come, go. This is the central thing we hear, we recite. This is the most sacred, what should I say, icon for the Sikhs. And this is to be translated, to be put into academics. How do you go about it? So it's quite, quite challenging, but this is, this is really the text. And Guru Nanak's um, verse is, um, he has 974 Shabads um, and they are throughout the Guru Granth Sahib. Uh, most of the Guru Granth Sahib is in the Rag sections, you know, 31 chapters. And Guru Nanak's is in, we find that in 19 chapters of those. And each of those chapters begins with Guru Nanak's first, then goes into the Gurus. And we must also acknowledge that the fifth Guru compiled the holy book and also included the verses of the Hindu saints and Muslim Sufis. So it's a very rich text. You know, so it's the Sikh Gurus going on Guru Nanak's model, his basic fundamental principle, there is one reality and that one reality be, can be addressed in myriad ways. So the, this, is the, this is what is the focus and Guru Nanak is the starting point. Um, so um, the poet, as I call him, and I've gotten into trouble about it because somehow the other, we think of poetry as being very kind of derog in derogatory terms, um, but it really isn't. Guru Nanak invites us himself. Here is his self-identification. Saas ma sab jyo tumara, tu mein khara piyara, nanak saer ev kahet hai, sache parvadgara. So saas ma, you know, look at his language. Sas, every breath, my flesh, mass, this is all yours. You are my kara, you are my absolute love, sheer love. Nanak shair ev kahete, so says poet Nanak, you are our true provider. Parvadgar comes from the Islamic world, uh, Pyaras. I mean, there's so many, so many languages kind of, you know, the etymologies that come into play here. Uh, but the poet Shair, this is, this is kind of from the Arabic. And as we know, um, Sayyid Hussein Nasser, who was a great eminent scholar of Sufism and so forth, describes this, this is not just, you know, we, we can't think of it as something derogatory. It's really comes from consciousness. It comes from knowledge. So poetry, I think we need to 
widen the scope. I mean, we have it, which is very sacred in the Gurdwaras, what you just saw, but my whole impulse is to bring it out and have it in classrooms, have it in symposiums, have it in poetry reading contests. So I want Guru Nanak to come out from, from where, you know, where we six, where we have held him in very sacred precincts to the globe, outside, everywhere, the parameters, because what he speaks about is the infinite one, and that's where his word needs to reach. So that's really my, um, you can see where I'm coming from. Um, again, I, as you know, Plato, he was very much against poets. He, he knew because the poets had all that empathy, that passion, and he kicked them out from the Republic. But Guru Nanak made it very central to his whole teaching to his message. This is what he did. Now, I just want to say how the translations kind of compare. This is my translation, my breath, my flesh, my very life is yours. You have, whereas uh, you can see in the uh, mainstream translation, which is a very good one, it is on our fingertips. I really admire what they have done. This is cityGranth.org. You can see my breath, my flesh, and my soul. I oopsie. Uh, how does that come about, you know? Uh, it's not there. So life, which is geo, geo life, which is very much is converted into some kind of soul, which becomes kind of, you know, that duality and so forth. Um, so that's what I want to say. So soul is troublesome for me. And then the word Lord, it's not there. So it's just, you know, there's nothing of that lordly image. It's so simple. It's so intimate. You are there. But then to put these lordly images is, is just not there. So, and then the poets, you are a true caretaker. So the law, again, the word Lord, it's not there. Parvadgar, caretaker, sustainer, nourisher. So those are the kind of things I want to say. So anyway, my poetry is legitimized by Guru Nanak himself because he calls himself a poet. Number two, also a very eminent scholar of the Sikh world who happens to be my dad, uh, Professor Arban Singh in non Origins of the Sikh Faith, this is what he says. No other way would have been adequate to the range and depth of his mood. This is Guru Nanak. His fervent longing for the infinite. So this in a way, this little, sent, this little, uh, you know, this little comment by Harban Singh really captures Guru Nanak's poetics. One is his fervent longing for the infinite, his joy and wonder at the beauty and vastness of this creation, so all of this creation, his tender love for his fellow people, his moral speculation, and his concern at the suppression and exaction to which the people in his day were subject. So every little bit, so this is all about, so here is Guru Nanak profoundly metaphysical, and yet he's celebrating the everyday world. He's making connections with fellow human beings. He has moral objectives, ethical paradigms that emerge from his poetry. And he is very socially, politically aware of what people are suffering. So you have a lot of um, you know, human rights, his pathos, his empathy, is all comes about. And his Babarwani, for example, it's just been lauded as one of the most beautiful war poems. And um, you know, his understanding of society was really incredible. So his compositions reveal an, un, an abounding imagination and a subtle aesthetic activity. And that's what I underline, subtle aesthetic activity. To me, that's the poet Nanak. So aesthetic, we don't want to, you know, aesthetics is sometimes in Western philosophy, you have philosophy up there or religion, and then you have ethics, and then you have aesthetics at the bottom rung. I don't think that's the case. Guru Nanak's aesthetics is the religious. It is the one that he's talking about. It is the one he's, he is in love with, but it is saturated in beautiful, lyrical, very kind of aesthetic um, verse. So the aesthetics is not, not to be denigrated. This is what it is. And it comes together, the aesthetic and the religious, I would say, are totally bonded in the Sikh world. Oops, it's not going. Uh, how come it's, it's, 
Okay. Sure. Um, so Guru Nanak's literary repertoire, I would say, is enriched by his artistic inclusion of terms and concepts and you know, diction that was current amongst Hindus, Muslims, Buddhists, yogis, and Nats. As I said earlier, it's a very rich culture, very rich landscape, and there are lots of languages coming together. So he's using those terms, but what does he do? There are three things I think that is important to his poetic strategy. Number one, he transforms their external practices into internal processes. So you, you have the terms coming like arti, beautiful arti, beautiful summer images, and decorating deities and so forth, yogic exercises, etc. But these are all transformed into mental interior activities. So he takes on, he's not denouncing them, but he's kind of trying to put them, match the exterior with the interior. That's his whole, whole poetic impulse, I would say. Number two, he shifts their sacred space be it the temple or the mosque or the monastery or the cave to the social wor world where everyone, everyone must equally carry out their human responsibilities. And that's where you find very much focus on this world. It's not to denounce the world. It's not to reject the world. It's not to go up into the mountains. That's where he has the Sid Ghosht and so forth, his dialogue with the various yogis. Come into the world. We are humans. We have moral responsibilities. We have social responsibilities. So it's very much his his ethics. It's his existentiality, which is very much uh, oriented towards the world. How to live? How to be human beings? To be human beings is not easy. To be human. That's what Guru Nanak is urging everybody to do. And the third one is he expands their adored deity to the transcendent infinite that cannot be incarnated in any tangible shape or form. So what he's doing is he's using lots of terms from the Arabic, from the Persian, from the Indic, from Buddhism, from Jainism. But what he's doing is giving it his own uh, kind of twist to those to kind of bring everybody together. But because there is, it's the one is infinite, nothing can be in, excluded from that. So everything is, in, is included in, in his vision, but you have to make that, you have to understand when he uses the word Hari, for example, it's not Hari Vishnu, it's Hari the divine one, which is all inclusive. So those kind of, you have to kind of shift our, the words are not this equals that, but they're much more plural and open. But he's using them by using familiar motives and customs of his, con he wants to convey his, the, the ideals, his philosophy is very distinct and unique. And that's what needs to be understood, but it creates that emotional appeal. Uh, poetry, uh, as I said, oops, uh, Lord. Uh, poetry composed, um, so what is it, you know, just to, this is basically what I want to share with you. What is Guru Nanak's poetry all about? The language, the language is love, which comes in the Japji Sab. So it transcends religious, cultural, linguistic, social boundaries. So essentially it's archaic Punjabi draws upon a variety of regional languages and social um, dialects besides uh, Seraki, the language of Southwestern Punjab and old Kari Boli, the language of Delhi region and the basis of modern Hindi and Urdu. Guru Nanak abundantly utilizes vocabulary drawn from Persian, Sanskrit, and Arabic. So there's a whole plurality of languages that comes into play, which, which becomes a challenge for a translator. You know, what do you do, use? Where do you go to? Here is a word. Do you trace it back to Sanskrit? Do you trace it back to Persian, Arabic? Where is it all coming from? So anyway, but, but what I want to emphasize is it's a language of love. He says that himself, Pakya, Pao, Pakya language, Pao, love, apar, infinite. So that's the language. Two, theof, uh, theof, theophilia. So theophilia. So philia is very important. So I'm translating Guru Nanak's love into how it appears in his poetry. It appears as theophilia, which is all love for the divine one, ikonkar. And here again, he had a whole lot of vocabulary in front of him he could have used, but what does he choose? It's a numeral one, ik, literally numeral one, and that's very unique. But into that one, any, any deity, any image, any, 
anything we can possibly imagine. He leaves it open. The imagination is unbounded, borderless imagination. We can use that. So that one is infinite. That's, that's Guru Nanak. Uh, so the whole, whole, whole text is saturated. Whole, the whole, his whole literary repertoire is the love for this divine one. One. Number two is somatophilia. And I, you know, this is something, and that the translators so forth, there's something about our body that we find progenitive. And it's kind of uh, this. So, what I want to say is that somatophilia, he emphasizes that very much. Um, and as philosophers like Elizabeth Gross and others have pointed out, it's a bipolar glitch mind-body dualism. The mind associated with the male, spirituality, eternity, liberation, somehow gets split from and privileged over the body associated with the female, sensory, temporality, imprisonment. And that's what his, what his milieu was. Most lovers of God, the religious, devotees and lovers of knowledge as well, philosophers, these mind lovers, theorists, especially disparage somatic associations. For Guru Nanak, bodily senses are instrumental. They have the potential to develop morally and bring ultimate fulfillment or degenerate into vices that destroy the self. So he offers somatophilia as a distinctive way of conceiving, perceiving, and enacting through the body. And um, so there's a word, the words, sometimes he just uses terms, you know, the punch, tre, you know, certain numbers just appear. And so what does the five mean, punch? So to me, these are five senses, you know, what we have to see and hear and smell and touch and feel. So those are very significant. And these five, these are our only instruments. These can be refined into sap, santok, param, tiraj, which is truth, contentment, morality, patience, compassion, or they can regress, they can degenerate it into calm, growth, no more, ankar. So to me, those are these, these have to be, the whole thing is to refine these. This is what we have. These are not to be disregarded. And I think most of his contemporaries were disregarding them. And so he wanted to bring them to the front. So what I'm saying is somatophilia is the opposite of somatophobia. And our culture is somatophobic all across, through the centuries and across the continents. The third point I want to bring is his biophilia, love for nature, biodiversity, and everything. The, the, the divine is not somewhere out there. That, that's the difference. You know, when, when people translate, you know, into Guru Nanak's uh, one into God, somehow that one, that monotheistic notion of oneness is very different because that one is out there. The creator and the creation remain apart. Whereas the one is everywhere. It's there, it's here, everywhere. So Vismad Rup, it's, it's the whole point. All of it is really, uh, he's wonderstruck because the divine is seen and felt and smelt and touched everywhere. Vismad Roop, Vismad Rang, Vismad Tarti, Vismad Kani. So this earth, this planet is all full of wonders. Vismad Kani, all the species, you know, under Jada Seta Jutpa, all the species are, are wondrous. So there's nothing, you know, so there's a whole equality again. So this is where his equality comes in, whether it's gender equality, racial equality, caste, class, species. He does not see any difference because the sparrow is, is singing, khodai, khodai. You know, so he has real love and respect for each and every being in this world. So it's a biophilia. So it's not, I, I think feminist scholars have said how people are very much oriented to this kind of necrophilia in certain religions. So you look for what happens afterwards, whereas Guru Nanak's focus is very much, how do you become a good human being? What do you do? How do you make the best of this life? 
I think is very much oriented towards making, refining yourself in this world. And the last one is anthropophilia, where there's love for fellow human beings, you know, and that's, uh, I must say, that's very important. You get married, you have children, families, society, community, extremely important. And we should all be working for the communal good. And that's where his proxies, the practices, what is Sikhism all about? How do th those things take place? What is Sangha? Coming together, fellowship, langar, eating together, get rid of caste system. We are all together, men and women cooking together, coming together, eating together, everybody equal, sitting on the floors and having it, and then seva. Doing not just seva for the Sikhs, for the whole global community. And we saw what people did during COVID, how much people, Sikhs in Delhi and Sikhs, you know, the one who cremated everybody uh, did not matter to him, Hindu or Muslim or Sikh uh, during COVID. So there are real great paradigms for us, you know, and that really comes from Guru Nanak's message, love for fellow human beings. You cannot, you know, it's not, love for God does not mean that you don't love, love the fellows, everybody here. So it's a connection of those. So that to me, that's those are the themes that emerge in his um, poetry, the whole text. So these are the two works that I did. I want to move on. The first Sikh, um, which, and the two, two are really, this came out about two years ago, and this came out as Jawala was saying recently. But what I want to say is, these are two very, there's a real symbiosis between them, because what I was, um, doing was working on Guru Nanak's poetry, really his language is going into his world. And from there, I could see who the person was. What was his philosophy? How is he a revolutionary? How is he an environmentalist? How is he into human rights? What's he talking about, you know, his ethics and so forth, all could be derived. So the two, this, this is, the whole thing is contingent on, on his Bani itself. I didn't go through, I, I looked at the Janam Sakis, very few by Gurdas and so forth, but my real source was the primary source to see Nanak, who he is from his own words. So that's what I did. All right, now to the translation. Translation, the challenges and so forth, translating. And I've been doing it actually for the last uh, 30 years or so. And I'm very grateful. My first person was uh, Kapani, uh, Dr. Narendra Singh Kapani for the Sikh Foundation. I, you know, and he's the one who asked me to do. And my first, uh, I don't have it here, um, was in the in HarperCollins Sacred, Sacred Literature Trust or something. And Prince Philip was uh, the sponsor for it. So I remember court of St. James, we had a big reception there, so forth, you know, for that book. And that's all Nitne Bani, the name of my beloved verses of the Sikh gurus, and that I have done it. And so I've continued on with it. And what surprised me is also, when I started teaching at Kobe College, I had read the verses, I knew Gurbani, but when it came into translations and I was studying it with my students, it just became so different. So I wanted to, really look at it myself. And that's what I have been doing. So according to Martin Heiger, Heidegger, translating does not only move between two languages, but there is a translating within one and the same language. And what do we mean by that? So yes, it's in Punjabi, archaic Punjabi with all the words. So just interpreting it from there is, is Is a translation itself, what you know, social worlds and the traditions and our intellectual habits that we have, and it um, it it does not do justice to Guru Nanak's verse. Somehow, our own inhibitions come into play. So there's a and translating between two different between Punjabi and English that also because English, you know, India was a British colony, uh, people learned English through these missionary schools, etc. And how the Bible is translated comes into play in many of much of um, the translations. So um, the, the um, challenges, I would say, multivalent diction. So the words like man, what do you man, how do you translate man? 
man is heart, man is mind, man is self, man is, you know, it, it's just Guru Nanak himself says, you know, man is so many different things. So how do you make, make it into one, you know, you can't identify, you can't look at it as a, um, you know, that this is it. So that multivalence, the languages are so rich. And I think that's why this speak, it's, it's timeless poetry, timeless words. And they should be, we should be open to their, uh, to their meaning and nuance and so forth. And then it's a spiffy style, so terse. So I might read you um, a little bit. Um, where is it? Okay. Just so, so, um, just, just the pithiness of his style, you know, short, short, terse. Jeta sabad surut tun jeti, jeta rup. Kaya teri, tu ape rasna, ape basna, avarna duja, karo, kaho mai, kaho mai, tu ape rasna, ape basna, avarna duja, kaho mai. Saheb mera eko hai, eko hai, pai eko hai. Very, very simple, beautiful. And, um, you know, tu ape rasna, you, you yourself are the rasna, the taste, ape basna, this fragrance. There is no other mother to speak about. Sahib mera eko hai. My one, my divine, my sahib is one. One, there is no other. So it's just the simplicity and beauty, beauty of it. And that's hard to translate, you know. And then it's uh, beautiful musicality. That is also um, um, hard to capture. For example, um, you know, just the way the words go. Uh, how do you translate, you know, from one language to how do you transmit taste, you know, from one tongue to another? It really becomes a challenge. Here's a verse. Har har har, har har har, kanth hai pehre, damodar dant lehi, kar kar karta kangan pehre, in bidh chit terei. You see the repetition, you see the alliteration, the assonance, the rhythm, the flow. It's all so internal. There's nothing, aesthetics is not something that comes from outside. It's built in, in the poem itself. Har 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 kant hai. Har har, hari hari is the kant, the har, har, which is worn around the necklace. So it's the bodily image, you know? So the divine, the one, the infinite one is made into a little garland, a necklace that goes around. And then kar kar karta kangan pehre, kar kar, you know, the actions, the karta of the creator. So in, that's the bracelet that you wear. So very kind of jewelry and all that but with great metaphysical import. And so it just, it's very hard to translate, you know, to kind of go back and forth. Then there are, of course, culturally specific tropes, you know, um, one of my favorites, and I had a lot of problem with my editors because Vari Vari Jawa, I don't know why I love that so much. Vari Vari, maybe I heard it from my grandmother's lips, you know, when you're really ecstatic, you meet somebody, oh, va ter, ter, Vari Vari Jawa. And Guru Nanak uses it. And I wanted to keep it going round and round, that kind of a vertigo effect, you know, because you're so enchanted, you're so mesmerized by something that you just want to go, you go kind of crazy. Divana, Baya Divana, that's also Guru Nanak. So that, that emotion, that affect is very significant. And, uh, but when you try to translate it, you know, Round, I go round and round. It just doesn't make much sense. So, but I wanted to keep it. I don't know how I succeeded or not. But and then other words like dust. May I be the dust of your feet. That to tour, you know, like that's a symbol of a cultural uh, trope for humility and so forth. And Guru Nanak uses it again. May I be the dust of your feet or dust of your Doesn't make sense. So those cultural tropes are very difficult. And then repetitions and echo words. There's a lot of repetitions like har har, uh, sun sun. Uh, dek dek jima, then dek dek jima. You know, so those those little. So how do you translate those into English or echo words? Runchun, pane runchun, savanaya. You know how the English does. It. And then of course myriad words for love, pyar, muhabbat, rang, snake, chow. You name it. It goes on and on. And English is such a popper when it comes to the word for love. 
And then there are so many pluralistic genres and styles. I mean, you know, basic, simple things, but they become Barama, the 12 month compositions. And then there are, um, you know, bars and there are chants and there are a whole lot of, you know, acrostics there, tons and tons of various styles and genres that he uses. So that all M.M. Um, M. McAuliffe, who was one of Max Arthur McAuliffe, who was one of the earliest translators, he started it. I don't know how many years it took him, and he acknowledged the difficulty. If he knew all the difficulties, he wouldn't have done it anyway. But it's, and yet, after all this, there's a lot of fun. Here lies the fascination of an adventure. It removes the conditions and obligations of everyday life. It ventures out into the uncertain. So that's Gadamer, truth and method. So I think. It's also exciting. And I've, from day one, I remember my, uh, you know, when, even when I was an undergrad, when I was doing the physics, my, it was a Christian scholar who was my teacher, Lucetta Maori. And I said, no, I want to find, you know, so I was doing it. And there's something very exciting to enter into that world, figure out new meanings. We can't have those molds, you know, just stuck there. We have to feel them anew and give up old intellectual habits. I think that's something we do. Oh, Lord, God, Lord, so thous and these and so forth, which have permeated into the translations of the Guru Granth, make no sense. They just create aberrations. God, it is not God. When Lord is not there, I showed you, and we'll see some other examples too. Or soul, soul creates a dichotomy. It's kind of, you know, it's G, geo, geo, geo is life, being. Um, oh yes. Um, there's a uh, where does it, there's a very nice, lovely, lovely, lovely uh, phrase Guru Nanak has. Ape gun, ape kathe, ape sun vichar. Ape gun, you know, it's kind of the song, song of praise. Ape kathe, singer. Ape sun, itself the uh, hearer, ap thinker. So the one is everything. Har jiyo tu karta karta. Har jiyo. Har, the one geo makes it very, very kind of um, very intimate. Geo with respect. Har geo, tu, tu, you. Where does the Lord come in? You know, tu, tu, karta, karta. You are the creator. You are the maker. Geo pave. Then the same word appears. Geo pave. But here the geo is different. Geo as pave. Tyo rak tu, naam mile achar. Har ra naam mile achar. As you want, keep us as you want, you know. So it's kind of giving the divine one the um, urging the one, keep us as you wish. So, so what I'm saying is um, the vocabulary is very rich. So we have to see things anew. And uh, I've written on this too. I wrote one, an article many years ago that uh, we should translate without using the terms God, Lord, uh, or soul. And my other uh, you know, what I did in this translation was use the many, many words that Guru Nanak use addresses for the one itself. You know, wherever he says, Hari, Ram, Shringar, Parvadgar, Ram, Rahim, all those terms should be used. Why not? But we have to see them anew. They, they, are, they should not be cast into the old modes. He's using them in a new way uh, that because that's also the father, the mother, you know, the one is everything, so it cannot, nothing can be excluded from it. And so the ultimate thing is languages are not strangers to one another, but are priori uh, or interrelated in what they want to, exp want to express. So this is Walter Benjamin, uh, the task of the translator. So there's a real parity of languages and um, the some, somehow or the other uh, Punjabi and English can be come very close to together, but we have to respect both. I remember learning English going, growing up in colonial Punjab, the English we learned was all very, you know, Shakespearean and kind of highfalutin and so forth. It was only coming to America, kind of that simplicity, the local language, the vernacular, because he's writing in the vernacular. So it has to be translated in the vernacular rather than those kind of, you know, thous and these and making it are very archaic. And the other suggestive uh, suggestion I have is the interlinear approach that's also, um, a suggestion made by Walter Benjamin that where we keep things, you know, and that's why the office translation was very good with Harvard. You have this sentence here, you have that. So where they come as parallel, 
they face each other and then your own kind of old habits and so forth are less likely to enter into it. I didn't realize time is going by so fast. I better get going. Okay, I just I want to share with you the Janam Sakhi too because these are um, this is an early Janam Sakhi. It has the date. It's a very interesting manuscript. It's at the India Office Library. It's dated to 1733. So we have the date, we have the name of the patron, we have the name of the scribe, and we have the artist. So it's a very, very interesting Janam Sakhi. And Janam Sakhi's are stories about Guru Nanak, but they also these, they set up the stage for Guru Nanak's verse. So there's a real symbiosis between Guru Nanak's poetry and these narratives. And so I want to start out with this one. This is what Alam Chand Raj starts out with. Very interesting. Not with Guru Nanak's birth or anything, the artist himself. He starts out with this painting. And that's Guru Nanak's first day at school. And you see him with a wooden board. And I want us to make a note of it. I know I, I wish I'd spent more time here. Um, I, I do want you to look at the uh, verse here because this is this is what is being, um, this is the verse that goes with the narrative. So the narrative you see Guru Nanak with this little wooden board where he's going to be kind of projecting what he's going to be writing, um, his whole metaphysics. Um, you have the scholars, some other kids down here. Um, so the verse itself from the Gurgan Sab, Jal mo kasmus kar mat kagad kar saar, pao kalam kar chit likhari gur puch lik bichar, lik naam sala lik, lik antana para var. Burn all lust, ride it into ink, burnish the mind into smooth paper. Love as pen, awareness as cried, question the way. Which I want us to emphasize that. Because Guru Nanak's poetry is not, he's not giving us answers. He's not giving us doctrines. Here it is, do this, do that. There's no such thing. There's no, no prescriptions, no rules, regulations. He wanted to change the attitudes, the consciousness of the people. And that's why his poetry is very important. And that questioning, the way. he never gives answers. When, when was the world created? We don't know. You know, if anybody had the answers, they would have given. Nobody knows. So he, but he makes us question. How do you, very early on, you know, there's truth, but how do you break the walls of falsity? He wants us to think about, he's really kind of a very modern instructor, I would say, where rather than giving answers, he's making us question and really making us think and so forth. And then of course, write the name. So you question and then you write the name, thinking that process that goes, writes of keep on writing. And so the, this is my translation. And the one below is write the praises of the Nam, the name of the Lord, write, write over and over that he has no end or limitation. So kind of just extra gender, patriarchal language, just doesn't, it's not there, you know, there's no, no Lord anywhere, you know, there's nothing really. Love is pen, love is the pen. So that's what I'm saying. Pao, pao kalam here. Earlier he had said language, pao, kya pao. So love is what goes on. So anyway, it's a very nice. And I think that's, that's, that to me is the foundation of Sikhi. Who are the Sikhs? Sikhs are seekers, disciples. So in a way, this little, this little, what should I say? A Janam Sakhi, simple Janam Sakhi is making a very important point. It's giving us the very foundations of the Sikh faith. Guru Nanak coming into a classroom. So Guru Nanak's poetry has to enter classrooms. That's, that's my connection. I wanted to come into classrooms. Uh, this is another one. This is when he's going through an existential crisis. Uh, so you can see the, the, pre, uh, the physician coming over, the father standing here. The image of the, uh, the female image is kind of unclear because in the Sakhi, in the narrative, it says it's his um, wife. But here, it seems Guru Nanak is much younger. It seems like as though it were his mom, but uh, it's not, you know, it's Mata Tripta. It seems like it. It's unclear to me. So rather than wife Sulakhani, it could be Mata Tripta. But anyway, so um, again, uh, here is again, we were talking about cultural, uh, you know, tropes. How do you translate them? Look at how simple it is, you know? So bad physician is called with all his physical physician's knowledge, you know? So he's looking at the 
he's holding on to the arm tondo le you know he's holding on to it pakad and he's looking for it searching pola vedana jane pola the poor vaid the naive vaid does not know kadak kale je mai so the kadak kadak the pain not the pain actually that's what they have translated as how do you translate kadak kadak is when the lightning goes you know it's more like a shooting pain kadak kale je mai not in the heart this uh, that the pain was in the mind so those are my questions for siri grant or uh, translation first it's not foolish it's naive and then it's more than a pain it's a shooting kind of you know kadak ke and the it's not the mind it's kaleja you know kaleja is the liver it's a visceral organ which is really the seat of everything and i remember my granny calling me kaleja da tukda you know piece of your liver but if you can't translate how do you translate it so um anyway those are the problems of translators and i but mine doesn't go anyway um so this is meeting his mom and everything uh these are uh these are some with unis travel somewhere there are temperances these are kind of seducers who are sent by a king to seduce guru nanak but the these they are in turn seduced by guru nanak with his message and so forth and this is the narrative that goes drinking the cup of love the intoxicated became ecstatically blissful like water merges with water they were drenched in loving devotion so that's that's the impact of guru nanak's poetry so they hear his verse and they are you know they totally transform and that's what the janam sakhis are relaying that it's very transformative um this is again very beautiful you know what i want to say is whenever the the, the woman is used in the sirigranth.org there's always sorry there's always the word uh, soul that appears with it i don't know why it's not there you know khima sigar kamantan pare rave lal pyari it's only the pyari but somehow or the other the word uh, you know appears common it's just common with it soul it's kind of you know giving it a ghostly metaphor it's not taking away her palpability the body the humanity and making it into something other which is very distorting i would say um now this is the last image i want to share with you so this is baba nanak showing his bruises um guru angad is there this is this is the 56th uh, uh illustration from the b40 janam sakhi uh, guru angad is guru nanak passes on his uh, succession to guru angad and to me it's a very sophisticated very powerful image and i think as reading macleod saying something oh it's it, it's too sophisticated for the janam sakhis but i would totally disagree with him it's really is very impactful because here what the narrative is guru nanak um, there was a there was a shepherd the night before and he was taking his sheep and goats and so forth and he's going through a bushy kind of a thorny terrain and um he's reciting guru nanak's aarti sohla so he's doing that and guru nanak is with him the poet nanak is with so the verse and the poet are totally coalesce together and since it was a bushy terrain guru nanak gets the thorns and all bruise him so he's showing his bruises to guru angad and to me this is really foreshadowing guru equals bani identity the guru granth sahib bani guru guru hai bani vich bani amrit sare all that is done here and what we say uh, you know guru granth ji manyo pargat guru ki te you know guru granth know the guru granth as the body of the gurus i think this is foreshadowing that and so the uh, i i just wanted to leave you with with this uh, arti soila the words itself where guru nanak was very much a part there gagan mathal ravchand deepak bani so what is this this is the arti he takes a symbol everyday symbol a cultural emblem where people perform uh, taking a tray platter on it lamps food coconut flowers everything is put on and you uh, circumambulate your favorite deity guru nanak takes that symbol cultural symbol that trope and makes it into an entirely different thing arti what the sky is the platter that infinite intangible skies 
and on it are the lamps are what the sun and the moon and the galaxies etc the sun the wood you know anyway so that's a galvanarai pulanta jyoti kaisi aarti hoye pab khandana teri aarti so that's the magical aarti where everybody is together hindu muslim jew christian we are all participating in this in this praise of the infinite one and that's nanak's um verse uh and i just wanted to leave you with this because um there is vangal's night and i think at night when i'm reciting the kirtan soila these images come to me and then go who was greatly influenced by zen art and how we all come together it's a global world so to conclude or oh, i better read my conclusion i had it written for you guys um to conclude guru nanak's poetry is calligraphed calligraphed in the language of infinite love bakya pao par and it is beautified by love bakya pai subhai it overflows in love the filia towards the self for the infinite one for fellow beings and love for the cosmos at large to use the words of american poet adrian rich guru nanak's is a relational understanding of language root tangled in the grit of human arrangements and relationships the timeless melodies intersect with concrete historical moments and in today's global society with its escalating divisions and polarizations they can serve cultural political psychological social spiritual and environmental needs guru nanak the poet helps us retrieve some of the usness usness of ourselves usurped by age old dualities theological conflicts and the challenges of modernity thank you such a wonderful presentation really love those images um before we get into the questions in the q and a i did want to kind of go back to a point that you you talked about at the at the beginning about this kind of this negative connotation in regard to the poet you said you got a little bit into trouble about this poet and this is something that is quite explicit in the writings of guru gobind singh like in his chopai sahib like kavio bach like the the speech from the poet he calls himself a poet very explicitly constantly and i really want to kind of dig into this a little bit more so students and those who are kind of engaging in gurbani um let's say for the first time or relatively new into their exploration into gurbani uh, a lot of people kind of think of gurbani the writings of the sikh gurus and when they begin looking at it they're looking for proclamations like you said you they're looking for doctrine and this kind of divide between poetry versus you know philosophical uh you know doctrine uh as if almost they're looking at like a legal textbook you know can you speak about the difference when somebody's looking at gurbani and what their approach should be you're absolutely right um jwala and that's what has our tradition has been and we we've really looked at it from that aspect you know the doctrinal as what what are the concepts and i did that myself too but what what we what we're missing is that remains at a very cerebral level what were the gurus doing he was not giving us doctrines he was giving us poetry so we have to keep with the impetus of the gurus the intention of the gurus and they were giving us poetry and that really hits us i mean aesthetics is not kind of you know something artificial or anything that is i mean a do we for example who we are what we do the the usness in us and our actions that's what the gurus wanted us to change and laws and rules and regulations don't change they wanted to change society he was a revolution nanak was a revolutionary he wanted to change the way things were and how could he do it through poetry which you praise when you praise what happens when you praise something opens up so when you really go for the words when you really feel the words something happens that's why the whole thing is kirtan he's not telling us you know sit down and follow this and do rituals sing you praise and when we praise so i think we should be telling i th that's what i say i feel our gurus were very radical liberal amagad whereas we sikhs are trying to hold and make them very insular and do something otherwise so we need to keep the spirit of the gurus open and these are they set up a momentum to really open up and to have everybody it should not just be for the sikhs it's for the hindus and muslims and for the christian because this is poetry is universal as aristotle said and it speaks to us and it's timeless i mean we take the walk 
six take the you know we open the holy you know our sacred text and we and here it is it really hits us what we are thinking about that particular day that particular moment so there's a real intersection of the two and i really feel and that's something you as a professor as you go on i want to emphasize to the younger generation of course this is our reverent text but we need to enjoy it savor it rasiya hove muska kaatha pool pachane that's what guru nanak said we we'll want cognition and he said that you know you want to know the flower you want to know the rose smell the rose so it's a process itself and we forget that what's a rose what does it mean you know this is going to plato the essence that platonic that's out there he's done he's getting rid of that but in here in this rose see the divine the infinite one he's really is his whole orientation is in the particulars the particulars palpitate with the universe can so i ask you about that yeah uh, in regard to this idea about ras and in yes. gurbani we have this idea that okay we, maybe we should orient ourselves towards hari's ras the ras of the divine but how do we then you also talked about the senses and this kind of yes. a this is kind of a, a it's kind of a where you're kind of elevating the senses or kind of let's say training the senses to engage with that but how yes. how does that happen and it doesn't result in like a regression of the senses that you talked about like can there be an obsession about sensuality uh in the mo- in like kind of the the physical world where it take it deviates you from a divine ras yes because what he says is i wish i had read that um uh, scripture but everything is good so long as we keep the infinite in mind the transcendent the infinite whatever whatever i'm seeing if i'm seeing this you and i see, you know that that's what, uh, what what does guru nanak say about the yogi who sees that infinite one in everybody so so long as i see that spirit in you so so it's not then that ego goes away you see i if i'm doing everything for myself uh when i see the duality then it's for my arrogance my this but when i see the infinite one i want to help you and i want to help him and i want to create a relationship with people so we have to really without without our eyes to see the divine everywhere to smell every which way and that's what the jains were doing remember uh, some monks were doing and they were going into manure and so forth you know to to um uh, to to kind of create to deaden the body and he did not want that that that's what the ascetics were doing you know putting all that uh, you know ashes on their smearing them and he wanted people to live hasandya kelande kavandya vichhe hove that was guru arjan you know fifth guru but that's the philosophy that um but we so i i i understand but what i'm saying is this is the refinement comes with through kirtan langar sangat seva he gave us these practicalities too how do we how do we refine our senses by doing seva otherwise i'm arrogant if i go that's why the dust of to be the dust of your feet people in gurdwara still clean the shoes and so, to build up humility so those are the ways you know but it doesn't mean you're sitting somewhere and working for your own salvation or anything but helping others so you see what i'm saying it's the senses are very important i really think mm. the punch are very important and that's something we don't want to do body is bad body is bad soul is good you know honestly i was once in a gurdwara sahib and bbc was um taping me recording me and i said this is the body of the gurus and they said no this is not the body of the this is the soul <laughs> of the gurus and i said well if we say that guru granth pargat guru ki de 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 is body what's wrong the gurus mantan everywhere it's mantan mind body together and when you read the translations the tan goes off the body is deleted so senses are somehow the other senses are these are these are the these, this is what i'm saying the cultural habits old patriarchal habits the androcentric attitudes that we have inculcated for all these centuries they need to be seen that uh, only then can we admire the newness of guru what is unique about guru nanak if you see him unique in his uniqueness it's such a it's such a brilliant point because as a community we're so embodied with symbology as well right like the the star of the case and all these kind of symbols is, and the cute thing that we listen to is through the ears that it gets uh, you know accepted the parcha that we intake we consume right we exactly. chuck, we kind of and, 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 and just keep in mind, 
very good today we are talking about the guru granth sahib what is the epilogue that guru arjan gave thal which then was again the thal that <laughs> guru nanak used for the thal for the uh. he uses it for the guru granth sahib can you imagine the guru granth is a platter a dish a plate with uh. three things dishes sat santok vichar truth contentment and reflection reflection je ko khave je ko punche this ta hoy udar it's not just to eat go to mcdonald's and gulp it down punche <laughs> savor the gurus are telling us to taste it that's why the whole thing has been put into musical melodies the rags mm. so it would so it would enhance the beauty and joy and we want to take it away somehow or the other there's that that old spirit you know that whole body denying the ancient what the gurus were against we are bringing it back very uh, a good point That's there's amazing. a question here uh, about uh, anan uh, sorry anna purna says a wonderful presentation to clarify the external and the internal are intertwined and in how guru nanak fo focuses on the inner realization uh, the beauty can you speak to that a little bit like this integration like we're talking about body with uh, you know the world and there's an integration can you speak a little bit more about that and maybe in regard to the kind of this love of nature like you quoted a line there from asad vivar uh, maybe you could speak about that a little bit uh, vismad khani vismad rang so, so so in a way that, that's thank you very much for that um it, it, i i think it's kind of the heightening of the senses uh, rather than oh, actually just let's think of the word aesthetics opposite of the what of aesthetics is what anesthesia where you're kind of dead and you go to the dentist and he does something and you don't feel a thing and i think guru nanak was he uses the word murad don't be like a more you know like dead corpse like body and t s eliot says that too you know lying on the under ether where you don't feel anything so guru nanak wanted us to feel see thank you dardana he's even talking to god the divine one you know in the uh, in the in babarwani don't you feel their pain so to have emotion don't just accept things as they are so your point the the so so it's the exterior world that kind of um awakens you you know knowledge is all there everything is there the one is there but what awakens you to the understanding of that one is the beauty is that wonder is a conversation with a fellow human being which awakens it and that's where the interior because everybody has an infinite one that's uh, you know if we had gone into the artim again sab mein jo jo the so everybody has the infinite one the transcendent is that's why the body is so important because the body har mandar kaya har mandar the body holds the divine one inside so it's there but how do we how do we sense it you know it's through our eyes through our ears through our smell fragrance rasiya ho with i keep saying rasiya ho muska only the one who who enjoys the fragrance knows the rose so that's how you kind of you know uh, the the and and actually that's a brilliant question thank you again i keep thinking about it because he says there's so many verses of guru nanak where he says it shows on your skin the exterior the joy the passion the rang you know it comes on your face the hue you know he uh, uh, those uh, who are not jale, right uh, mukhu, the yes episode. exactly uh -huh. ketichuti na mukujale and there are other ones to um you know it may be in in my translation i'll have to find it but there are words so thank you so so the interior and the even the body reflects the interiority when you are in bliss when you discover the transcendent one and everybody has that guru for guru nanak everybody has that transcendent is everywhere omnipresent but what awakens us to that what makes us mm. conscious those are the senses because without it how can you feel how, how can you exist without your senses and here we put it down so beautiful point um we have a question from rav tej god uh, it's kind of a, a question about poetics she says i have usually seen that every verse of barney ends with a nanak whether composed by guru nanak or not uh, i am not sure can you speak about this the the kalas the pen name yes uh, thank you thank you very much that's a very important question actually and i think that was kind of the what should i say that's a cultural a uh, style because everybody the poet says something you know you have that in uh, you know indic poetry all over so i think it's just that but but uh, what's interesting so they all end with nanak very good and the 
you know, the various gurus saw themselves as continuing on with the spirit of Guru Nanak too. But what's also genius, and that's a genius of our compiler editor, Guru Arjun, he very clearly states that, you know, Mahalla what? The Mahalla one, Mahalla ik, Mahalla duja, tija, chata, panga. So that Mahalla will tell you who that is. And with the Pagats, you have Ket, Parid, Pagat, Namdev. So with the, with the, with the Sufis and the uh, Pagats, you have their names. With the Gurus, you have Nanak. And yet, each of them is clearly identified. And that brings me to the point, rather than saying, oh, this is kind of a syncretic Guru Granth Sahib, they put Hindu, Muslim, everybody, everything. No, this is acknowledging each poet, the individuality. So Guru Nanak, I want us to keep in mind, he is very pluralistic. Everything permeates with that one. Everything palpitates with that one. And yet, no two are same. So the diversity is equally important to him. So the gurus are all, and the mahalla is the one that kind of different. That's a, yeah. I love that. Multiplicity and unity. Um, actually, kind of expanding on that, Indrapal Singh has a question. He says, in Gurbani, they often use the term guru and satguru. Does this mean the actual guru, like the ten gurus, or is this in reference to Vaheguru? Are they interchangeable? And if not, how do you tell when Gurbani is referring to who? Yeah, th 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 thanks again. And that that creates those, you know, that's where we talk about the complexities. Um of Bani, because these words are so, so multivalent, so polymorphic, you know, there's so many meanings, innuendos to it. And actually, Guru, Guru, Guru Gaur, Guru Barma, Parvati Mai, you know, for Guru, I think Guru could be, Guru, Guru Nanak's, in Guru Nanak's verse, Guru is used in so many different ways. I think Guru is just kind of a channel, a medium that awakens you get rid of your darkness. And so the guru could be, you know, in the Japji, Guru said, Guru Guru Barmang Parvati Jehu Janangarayana. Guru Ayanka Dei Bajai Sabana Jiyanka. So it's really what hits you, what strikes you. And Satguru, uh, yes, the true guru, that is the infinite one. But I, I must say in that sense, we really have to see the context of the verse. So that's what gives it. I mean, like, for example, I read you the word Jiyo. Jiyo is somewhere, something, and Jiyo, so there are multiple ways, and uh, these words are really uh, a very, very, uh, you know, very rich and open. And uh, it's it's really the passage itself that kind of shows us what 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 it is. But I really love that angle that you have about this kind of multivalence, uh, this the multitude of interpretation using words that are synonyms and very similar to each other. Um, uh, and uh, this idea about looking at Gurbani like a piece of artwork that depending on the perspective that you're viewing the piece of art, you're going to draw a different meaning from it. And exactly. one is and that's how it should be. And, and because there is no one meaning, then we are yeah. making it very static, very static. And that's I'm totally so new translations, new everything coming up. It would be really, really good. New interpretation. That's why I want. I really love uh, teaching uh, the Japji to my undergrads at Colby. They know nothing about Sikhism. And yet, if you could only see the response papers, how much they get out of it, it just gives me, that's why I love, love being at Kobe because they bring their fresh eyes and angles and perceive so much there. So near, you know, uh, there's just infinitely. Now, for example, uh, I just spelt it out, but manya, manya is a big word. I don't know how to translate it. I've you put it as embracing. I, I noticed that. Yeah, so this is my recent one. Before that I did, having trust or remembering. So in my various translations, I mean, and I said, no, it's really kind of money. You know, it's really kind mm. of really taking it inside you. It's really embracing it. To me, embracing does a better job than remembering or um, having trust or having faith and so forth. So yeah, no, I, I, I love the way even that you presented uh, that, like uh, how it's uh, embracing and then on the line below it it's the next uh portion kind of uh kind of spelling out the visram the pause in the line manek i love that um actually speaking about poetry manan singh is asking a question and i think i have a lot of thoughts on this i think uh, but we'll get your thoughts on this first he says given your demonstration of the value of poetry in contextualizing six scriptures is it 
also a viable means of practice to write poetry, Sikhi seems to find controversy in the production of new devotional context. So where's the line? Um, well, this is what we inherited. Of course, you know, we can we can be writing and translating and composing poetry. The gurus want us to be creative and innovative and new poetry for our new times. But this is what we have. This is our legacy. This is this is this is this is our treasure. You know, this is what we hold on to. And of course, we make new, you know, be poets, be artists. I mean, what Arpana Kaur does is just magnificent, you know. So, um, so there's no end. So I think what, your point, that's a really good one. And I think this is what inspires us. You know, I see so many Sikh artists, musicians, poets, you know, being inspired by Gurbani. That's, that's, that's what it is. So it should be a bedrock for us and we can go into whatever directions we want to. We should be. I'm really glad. Are you writing poetry, uh, Manna Singh? Is he? I don't think Manu can reply, but uh, oh, okay. uh, when you look in the history, right, you see that it was not only the Sikh Gurus, Pai Gurdas, you have, you know, the 52 poets of Guru Gobind Singh's port, uh, court, even, you know, philosophers, writers like Pai Guru Singh wrote such beautiful oh. poetry, um, Santok Singh, you know, legend in the 19th century, etc. Uh, poetry is just so embedded, right, within the uh, yes. tradition. Yes. We have a few so more my, questions. My question to you is, why do we look down upon it you know like I really I was doing a, a journal article somebody had invited me in to write a journal article I was doing it and I said you know poetry of the gurus Neji Gurbani you know so I had to change every of course it's gurus bani I'm not denying it whatsoever but I also want to make it open to the world see th that's the thing when we and I think that's my methodology overall, because when we talk about scripture and so forth, it's daunting. Somebody else's scripture. I don't want to read the Holy Quran. I don't want to read the Vedas. I don't want to read the Guru Granth Sabha. I don't want to read the Bible. There's some kind of a fear, a little trepidation of entering somebody else's world. So what I want to say is, um, if we look at it as a work of art, it belongs to all of us. It belongs to humanity. And so I want to bring, project Guru Nanak. Of course, he's our guru. I would never deny that. And he's the founder. I, you know, he's the one who gave us this big, the whole Guru Granth Sahib is contingent on, you know, starts out with him. So all that is, but I don't want it to be stifled there. I want it to expand. And, and by looking at art, I mean, that, that's how, for my students, if I have to, this is the Guru Granth Sahib and, you know, I can only have it, you know, if you cover your heads and so forth, the tr English translations, I wanted to want them to hold it in their hands, read the translations and make the most of it and interpret it from their angles. Yeah, no, I think that's a really good point. I really do think there's kind of more recently uh, emphasis given to propositional knowledge, you know, proclamations, you know, belief systems, doctrines versus affect, kind of, you know, engaging with something that's going to actually change how you feel and give you that emotional response. Um, Dilraj Singh is asking a question. Could you discuss the influence of Bible translations in India and its influence on translations in Indian texts? Well, I don't know about the Indian text overall. I've been looking, um, my focus has been on the Guru Granth Sahib. And yes, uh, what's the name again? Who asked that question? Dilraj Singh. Dilraj Singh Ji. It's really, it's, oh, it's really pathetic how much we have absorbed that. And even some of my readers, young, you know, not young, not you all, but uh, some people who grew up in India, colonial India and so forth, they may not like my translations because they're too simple. And even I was translating by Veer Singh and they wanted more, you know, like flowery, archaic language. And that's all Victorian sensibilities that we have absorbed in English Bible. I mean, right now, uh, Alter, you know, uh, he did a beautiful translation of the Bible and he talks about the same things, how biblical scholars did not use the word soul and so forth. He's bringing uh, attention to, to the body and, um, which I have been doing so for so long in the Sikh tradition, you know, because we, we without it, we wouldn't. so this overall with, with religiosity. So to answer your questions, they have all, look at any Gopal Singh, Macaulay, uh, even the new translations, uh, Lords, and so forth. They're all um, 
they've been so influential. They've, you know, we've had the false consciousness of the British, you know, we've absorbed it and that's how we learned it. And so the is so important. No, when he says, why should I use the word Lord and thee and thou? Why? You know, it's just I, I, that intimacy is gone. We make something and they do like it. People like it. That, that's a language because we want to halo language. And so I think it's created a lot of havoc. And, you know, the word Lord is not there. And you look at Sadie Granth Sabha, how many times it appears. The word soul, but any time the woman is mentioned, the word soul comes in. Bride, soul bride or whatever. You know, so where, where are these coming from? These are not in the G. G is life, being. Mira G and the G, you know. Uh, um, so, so we have to hold on to our own. We have. That's what I'm saying. Uh, the it has to be transparent. We we need to unclothe it. Who was it? I think it's Benjamin who says that that the poetry, you know, is it's like the fruit. The skin and the fruit are sewed together. But what we translators do is kind of give big robes, velvety robes, and you know, kind of fold them and so forth and make them look really grand and so forth. But the grandness, the subtlety, the beauty, the strikingness, the extraordinary power of the Guru's verse is in those little, little sentences, you know, and those go on to make solahas or 16 stanza hymns or what. But the basic is very, 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 very tiny, you know, and rhythmic. That was something yeah, I, I thought your poetry, yeah, your translations of the poetry was so, because some of the writings the Japanese have especially are so dense, and they're so, they're not really drawn out, and conveying that is very, very difficult. Um, and in relation to conveying it, Anish Man is asking a question. Thank you so much for presenting. I'm a huge fan of your published work. You have translated Gurbani in the past in hymns of the Sikh Gurus. Have you changed your approach uh, to translation in your latest publication? Some things, yes, because um, I did not use the word. Uh, thank you very, very much for reading and keeping a tab on me. Um, yes, I in this one, I used uh, the names, you know, whatever names the gurus had for the divine one. It, you know, if it was Sirirang, I used Sirirang. If it was Madhusudan, I used Madhusudan. I mean, of course, these are not incarnate deities, wherever Hari was used. So instead of using just one, not the divine one, I used that. And number two, I think, yeah, I changed certain uh, words to like Karam, Karam Khand, you know, the in the Japji, for example, you have, um, you know, the five stages, you know, you go from Karam Khand to um, Gyan Khand to Saram to Karam and to Sach Khand. The Karam, for example, I used to, early on, I remember translating as grace or something because that's how I learned it. You know, we are all cultural, um, you know, I learned it from the old translations. And this goes to the earlier question as well, the way I had read the translations of the Guru Granth Sahib. So then I realized this is not the realm of grace. This is really actions. Guru Nanak is very much action oriented because we make our own, we kind of create our own destiny through our actions. So to me that Karam Khand, I started doing it as a realm of action. And that's where he talks about heroes and so forth, Sito Sita and others and so forth. So yes, I've made uh, changes of that sort, but the main one I think was, um, you know, using using the names of the divine rather than just abstract. I really but love that cool. approach as well. Yeah. And the fact that, you know, in your uh, recent publication, you have footnotes at the end as well for those cultural specific tropes, explaining them um, and explaining some of the names as well. There's a question about um, from Harleen Graywalt asking, uh, where should one start if they're interested in learning and embracing sick teachings? I think just read the Jeffrey. <laughs> I would start out with the original. I really think so. And don't go through what uh, exegetes and interpreters says. You read it yourself. Read it again and again. It will speak to you. There really is. There's something. It's re they were taught, you know, I don't know why we make it into such a big thing because the gurus were speaking to the local people, to the regional people, to the everyday people. They're not talking to scholar. In fact, he was against all this elitism of the Brahmins and so forth, you know, that was against uh, people who were debating and discussing and so forth. It was more the simplicity of it. So I think 
that's why I think the senses, you know, kind of let it hit, have the affect. You said that yourself, mm. Jala. Um, I think you, you'll get, and then maybe simple, um, that would be good. Uh, well, mm, yeah, I would, I would okay. also suggest my first seek, you know, <laughs> simple, uh, simplicity, I think that's the best. I definitely encourage people that, uh, you know, would start with this uh, English translation. Uh, this question from Kabir, he says, could there be issues with using other texts to translate Gurbani? Example, Upanishads, if gurus were using other people's language to explain concepts in a way that was familiar to them, that would necessarily mean we should use their language the way they did. And then they say, thank you for the great presentation, but maybe speak to that issue about oh. using ideas from different traditions. Yeah, um, the thing is, I mean, we are all people of our, you know, of our times. I mean, this is what was there. For example, he uses the word arti. You know, we read the arti together. He takes the same thing, but he makes it into a totally different, he gives it a whole different significance to it, whole different import. So I think we need to uh, really need to look at the context, the syntax that they are using. And of course we have to know the words, you know, you have to know the language and so forth, but not get too, too caught up. You know, sometimes we, you know, Saram Khan, what is it? Where is it coming from? Is it the Arabic? Is it the Persian? Is it the Sanskrit Shrama and so forth? And sometimes the guru gives himself Saram Khan ki bani roop. You know, Saram Khan, so instead of all these debates and discussions, if you really follow, Nanak, it he gives you the answer. Saram Kandaki, the realm of Saram is beauty itself. So I kind of translate it as the realm of aesthetics or beauty. Uh, so um, you're very right. Yes, we have to be conscious what is being used. I mean, for example, Sirirang he uses the you know uh, the name for say of so many colors, but in his world, the transcendent is you know it's not one deity or anything, but the one with myriad hues, myriad colors and so forth. The whole cosmos is a part of it. So I think it's using the terms, but uh, but with his, his worldview, his horizon. Mm. And I think it's never to shut things down. And I think we all should, you know, nobody, there's no one. I, I, want, to, I want to keep repeating that, that it's really opening many, many new possibilities, many more exciting ventures. That's what the text is all about because it's poetry. There's no, this is what he said. We'll never know what Guru Nanak said. We really won't, but we can try to grasp it. And it was again, not knowledge. If we feel it, I think it's the affect. He wanted us and the affect was to become good human beings where we work collectively for the good of all, not just for one person. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, there's a question from Sujat Mirza. This is a question about translation. Is the process of translating a holy text in some ways transcendental? And does that experience expand the understanding underlying the text itself? Thank you. Uh, yes, the, I, I would say yes. Trans, uh, it is because you really have to see, hear, feel the words. You know, it's not, it's a really creative process. You want it to, you want the original to rebound. You can't just kind of, okay, I'm going to sit down and trans, you know, it, 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 yes, there is something, but you know when it's right, you know, you just hit it. So it's, it's really kind of, you, you have to feel the words inside, you know, so I, I, I kind of repeat, I hear what Guru Nanak, sometimes I get frustrated with him and like, what, tell me what you mean, you know? <laughs> um, so, um, it's, it's kind of never ending, but it's, there's also a joy. You can find, there is, I, I do feel there's some kind of English and Punjabi come together in a very beautiful way at some level, but you have to work for it. it just doesn't happen. Sometimes it happens instantly. And sometimes you just have to kind of think and rethink. And it does give you, thank you for your second point. It really does offer you a lot of knowledge. And that's why, mm -hmm. I said my book, The First Sikh, is totally derived from his Bani, from his poetry, because it just gives you such an, such, it gives you such depth. Unless, you, who was it? Um, I think it was um, our theorists. You have to have a real intimate, for a translator, you have to have a very, 
Gayatri Svivak, I think she says that, you know, we have to have a translator needs to have a very intimate relationship with, with the work. So you have to create that mm. intimacy. And I think Jhumpa Lehri goes even further than just intimacy. She calls it a very visceral experience. You have to read the text viscerally, again, with that body in order to really translate it. So yes, to answer your question, uh, you do acquire a deep knowledge and deep understanding if you if you go. Uh, sometimes it's just, you know, if you're just putting the same old words in the old modes, then not. But when you really uh, want, genuinely want to translate, you want to see something new, you have to, you do. Abs yeah, absolutely. When you, when you steep yourself in a certain text by a certain author, um, it's a weird feeling, right? You end up feeling like you might know, you have an essence of what they could be saying. Like they're, they're in the room with you, essentially. You're talking with them. It's exactly. a kind of a conversation. And you're never sure, by the way. You're never sure. So I would never say, oh, this is what it means. No, I would yeah. never say. But yeah, this is the best I, you know, that's what I think. And, and you know, so you're very right. You feel that in, oh, yes, I feel, mm. oh my gosh, when I, you know, Guru Nanak is always there when I'm translating and so forth, you know, his Bani is just circulating all the time, uh, uh, echoing. And that, that's what I would say, translation is an echo, it rebounds, uh, because you keep, keep you thinking about the original, you kind of, and, and for me, it was a lot of meaning, because I must say, I started very early translating it, because I left the Punjab when I was 14 years old. So I came here to a little girl's school in Virginia, where there was nobody to speak Punjabi with. So this was my, mm. I have a real longing for it. And so, uh, and some of Guru Nanak's language is very much like my grandmother's and that is going. I go to the Punjab now, it's becoming so modernized and so different. And we are mm. losing some of those typical, typical, you know, Tate Punjabi jedi hundi hai gie. And mm. I, I feel bad about that. So this is a way of kind of holding on to it, my way of holding on to my mother tongue. We talked a lot of, about the kind of benefits of looking at uh, Gurbani through a poetic lens. Uh, Sahaj Singh has a question of the opposite. Like, could poetry also be a, a dangerous lens of evaluation? Have you ever felt how that? So? In any I, sense? I'm just curious, how would it be dangerous? His long question is, uh, in the Islamic tradition, Muhammad was perceived to be a poet. This is in quotes by some of his contemporaries who were critical of his beliefs. The poet was seen to be something like a sophist of ancient Greece, a brilliant orator that cares more about conveying than achieving the truth. Uh, he says, I loved your lecture and recognized the value of analyzing poetic patterns in Guru Nanak Dev verses, but considering Sikhi's emphasis on resisting traditions, rituals, dogmas that distance oneself from the universal truth, could poetry also be a dangerous lens of evaluation? That was the I, I I don't quite see it because for Guru Nanak, all of it is, you know, praise. Praise is poetry, singing, singing. Uh, and he calls himself a tadi. So he's a singer. He's a songster. He's a poet. So I can't see him finding anything dangerous in that because this is the avenue to the truth. And this is how we, you know, the doctrines can be very divisive and dualistic and make us sit in little, you know, circumference ourselves. The, the poetry is, is a way of opening ourselves mm. up. So I, I'm sorry, but I don't see. Uh, I think uh, uh, the presupposition of that question is achieving truth requires a certain doctrine and po poetry can kind of deviate from that, um, no, which you've country. talked about how that's, yeah. Uh, to the contrary, I would say uh, doctrine is very divisive and so forth. To get to the ultimate truth, it's it's your, it's how you're feeling. What what you uh, cognize? How do you recognize things? The whole according. I mean, I'm just going by Guru Nanak, his word. Bujhe, suje. Till you, how do you bujnak sitches? No, how how do things? How do you rec recognize? It's all there, but that recognition is very significant. Recognition of truth is very significant. Give good to Tim. Hmm. How do you make, recognize truth? And I think the right. only way, the way he gives us is by praising. Does he give us anything else? Singing the praises of the infinite one. That's the way, that's what he gave us. That's the message I take from him. So I see no danger in, uh, you know, his poetic uh, singing. And uh, this, is, this is what opens the clogged arteries you know, all this hatred and how do we get rid of Kamkro, Lomo, Ankar? How do we get rid of our ego? 
I think doctrines, that's what the people were doing in his times. You know, my doctrine, I say this, and they were having their debates. And Guru Nanak was, hey, put those things aside. <laughs> baad ba baad, hey, huh? yeah. yeah, yeah, that doesn't, uh, so that doesn't take you to the truth. You know, truth in, in regard. In, in regard to that, there's another question, you know, what takes one to the truth in relation to salvation? Harpreet Kaur says, how have you reframed this concept of salvation uh, in your translations, moving away from the Judo uh, Christian lens, Judeo Christian lens? I don't understand what salvation is. You know, so, uh, it's just so uh, entwined with the kingdom of God and all that, you know, with the very Judeo Christian world. Uh, mm. what we have is liberation, freedom, and freedom is here. And freedom when you die, such kind of a sin car, you know, you become, become the truth that you are. So that's what it is. And then you become the finite merges with the infinity. I mean, that's such kind of a you know, that's, that's where to me, whatever salvation means is joining with truth and that's what we are to recognize that truth so the whole thing is recognizing the truth and that's where the, mm -hmm. group, the other questions came up you know um what's that awakens you um truth is right. such jugad such heavy such nanak hosi be such that's for sure how do we recognize it and this is the method poetry is the method that's all he gave us mm. plato banned the poets this is this is this is the way our parched our world especially today it's so parched for empathy and i think poetry that, that's what they're saying even now you know people need to read poetry to kind of become human beings are uh, just think what technology has done to us it's really ruptured us from our own bodies i mean i want to check the weather i'll check on my phone i won't put my foot outside the door <laughs> because we're really alienated ourselves we're alienated from ourselves we are alienated from our neighbors from the environment what we're doing polluting the environment and um so we need to kind of become whole see the mm. truth and the truth is everywhere and you know we'll take one more question here because yeah. we are over time getting, so oh I, my I, gosh it's beyond one i'm going it's i i thought it was you told me it was 45 minutes all, Jawala. <laughs> we are over time, so we can end here. Um, but thank you so much, uh, Dr. Singh. No, 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 go, go ahead with the question. I do. I the do last question from it was from Ruby Kaur. Uh, she's a student Ruby? of Ruby Kaur. Uh, she's a student here at, at Berkeley. She says, uh, Guru Sahib often refers to Pancha Shabad, Panch ak Akhar. Are these specific referring to something tangible, like actual Shabads? Uh, is it a metaphor or something deeper? Thank you. Be a beautiful question, uh, Ruby. Um, Shabbat, yeah, Panch Shabbat. Uh, I, I think it may also, he uses a lot of musical tropes. And I think it may be something Panch uh, Shunkar, you know, you hear the punch, you know, punch going for. So I, to, at some level, I really think it's a five senses. That's what I think. And it's them coming into harmony, being together, and creating this beautiful melody which we anhadbani you know like kind of that soundless sound so i think it kind of relates to that but it's not shabad it's not five shabads you know as such literally uh, it's 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 a it's at a you know at some metaphysical level that he's talking about. and i think it's related with the anhad shabad the soundless sound mm. and this uh, punch kind of makes you make you hear that make take you to that melody and again i come back to my point somehow or the other these are the five senses because without them we would not hear the soundless sound they mm. are they are the instruments to it okay Jawala, the thank senses. you so much i love it thank you I so love much the questions thank you very very much they were very yeah. inspiring for me and all the best to all of you Wonderful it's always a delight class. Um, I did want to end uh, saying that um, this talk will be posted online um, hmm. and all the questions will be emailed to you, uh, Nikki, so you will get a, a record of all this. Um, the video recording is, like I said, is going to be on the Institute's website uh, shortly after this. And I did want to thank quickly before we end uh, both you, uh, Dr. Singh, and the Institute for South Asian Studies here at Berkeley, the Sarah Kalat, Chair of India Studies, Sikh and Punjabi Studies, the Subarwal Fund for Sikh Studies here, Department of Art, uh, History of Art, sorry, uh, the South Asia Art Initiative at UC Berkeley. And uh, with that, we'll wrap up. We are over time. Thank you so much, uh, Nikki, again. It's, it's lovely talking. Um, 
and hope to see you soon and we can discuss some more. So Absolutely. take care, everybody. Thank you. Bye.